Well, today, on this last Sunday of August, crazy to even think about that, but we're closing out our series, Don't Jump Ship. It's been a great summer here at CTI, and we've covered some amazing things from God's Word. I hope that this series uh, has encouraged you, and I also hope that it's challenged you at the same time. I know that I've been challenged by some of these messages, and today we're going to close out with a super important ship, and that is stewardship. Okay, perhaps one of the most important and underrated of all of the ships because stewardship is so important to God. So how many know that if something is important to our father, it ought to be important to us, right? It's, it's a recurring theme throughout all of scripture, stewarding well what God has entrusted to us. Stewardship, simply defined, is really the way in which we care for or we manage our resources. Now, when most of us hear that definition, we automatically will assume that we're talking about material things like money, which is absolutely a huge component of, of stewardship, but it's so much more than just stewarding our finances and our material possessions. We steward our relationships, right? We steward our influence that we have. We steward our calendars. We steward our commitments. We steward our spiritual gifts. Pretty much anything that you and I have, whether it's tangible or whether it's intangible, are all the things that we're called to steward. And it turns out that it's very important to God how we take responsibility and oversight of all of these blessings that he's entrusted to us because all of them and really everything ultimately comes from him. But here's the reality. Stewardship is not an easy ship to sail on. It can be challenging. It can be complicated. And honestly, for that reason, many people make the decision to just throw up their hands and just say whatever when it comes to the subject matter of stewardship when it comes to being careful with the management of what God has given them. But what many can't see is that there are so many rewards that come with being faithful and diligent to steward what God has entrusted to us. And listen, I want you to understand where I'm going with this today. I'm not only talking about rewards that we will receive here and now on this side of heaven. I'm talking about eternal rewards like the kind that have no expiration date. But it all comes down to how we steward what God has entrusted to us. Stand with me to your feet, and would you open up to the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the third book of the New Testament, and we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 16. Just three verses today, 10, 11, and 12 from Luke chapter 16. Listen to these words that Jesus himself said. If you are faithful in the little things you will be faithful in the large ones. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? You can say, ouch, before we pray. Ouch. Jesus, I pray right now that you would bless and anoint the preaching of your words. Speak to us today, God, that we would remember that we have nothing that did not originate first from you in our lives, God. Father, I pray that the way that we handle everything that you have given to us would bring you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated today. These verses are actually Jesus' summary statement after a parable 
that he told. Now, for those who are new to studying scripture, those of you in the room who are new to reading the Bible, Jesus told many parables. It was one of his most frequently used teaching methods. And a parable was basically a story that Jesus would tell, and then at the end of telling that story, he would draw out a truth or a spiritual big idea about what he was trying to communicate. And this parable in particular was the parable of the shrewd manager. Other translations call this parable the parable of the unjust steward. Now, many people, they argue that this could be the most complicated parable that Jesus ever told in the Gospels. The reason for this is that in most of the parables that Jesus told, the protagonist or the main character usually would represent God or Jesus or some other positive character. But in this particular parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16, this one was somewhat unorthodox. How many know that Jesus was somewhat unorthodox? Because all of the characters in this story that Jesus told in Luke 16, they were all wicked. And Jesus pretty much uses an example of a dishonest businessman to make a point to his disciples. How many know that you can use anything as an example, right? Now, he wasn't praising the dishonesty of this man, and he certainly was not encouraging his disciples to emulate that kind of behavior. But there was a spiritual principle that he was illustrating for them. Now, we're not going to read the whole parable, but I want you to go home and read it later today in Luke chapter 16. What I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize it for us today. And so this is what Jesus says. He speaks of this wealthy man who calls to him his steward or his financial manager. He calls him in. He confronts the guy for mismanaging his resources. Somebody's about to get fired, okay? This steward, knowing that he's about to be without a job and without any money or income, he has to figure out how he's going to support himself once he's out of a job. So this is what he does. He goes to some of his master's clients behind his master's back and he starts to cut deals that are going to benefit him in the long run. He says things like, hey, listen, if you agree to give me shelter in just a couple of weeks when I'm out of a job, I'll immediately right here right now reduce the debt that you owe my master. He goes to the next client, and he cuts another deal. He says, if you promise me this, if you, if you do this for me, then I'll take the debt that you have right now to pay back to my master, and I'll make it even less. Now, even though the master didn't know this, this steward was operating on behalf of the master, so he really did at that time have the position and the credibility with the clients to do this. Now, here we go. After cutting all of these deals that will set him up once he's jobless. The wealthy master finds out about these business deals that his manager or his steward made. How many could imagine how that went, right? Now, I'm sure that most of us, we would assume that it's lights out for this steward. Now he's really gonna get it. But that's actually not what happened. In this very unconventional parable that Jesus told, this wealthy master, he's actually awestruck by the manager's shrewd business dealings, which I'm sure was very confusing to the disciples as they listened to this story that Jesus was telling. Listen, don't get me wrong. The wealthy master was not happy about this at all. He didn't approve of this conduct. But at the same time, he was pretty impressed that this steward jumped into action and was forward-thinking enough to take advantage of his present position to arrange a comfortable future for himself. Now, after he hearing all of that, you're probably sitting here today online thinking what the disciples were thinking. What in the world is the point of that story? Am I supposed to cheat the system just to get ahead? That doesn't sound like something Jesus would teach. 
Should I do dishonest things with my money to benefit myself and to make sure that I'm comfy, cozy in my future? That doesn't sound like Jesus. None of those. None of those are the takeaways of this parable. But what Jesus was doing, catch this, he was contrasting the people of this world and his own disciples, really all believers. He's saying that sadly, non-believers, people who don't follow Christ, they tend to be more strategic when it comes to the things of the world than believers are about the things of this world to come eternity. Jesus is making the point that most people in this world, they spend their lives, their whole entire life doing whatever needs to be done in order to prepare for a future of wealth and comfort. Like this unjust steward, he cheated his master. But in so doing, he set himself up for his future. But Jesus contrasts that to believers who spend very little time strategizing and thinking about how their decisions here and now will impact their eternal future. Jesus is encouraging his disciples. He's not, he's not saying cheat to get ahead. That's not it at all. Don't be unjust like this manager was. But why don't you have the same kind of urgency to prepare for your forever future and make decisions that will have an eternal impact? He's saying, steward what you have now in a way that will result in future blessings that will have an eternal value. You see, the principle that Jesus is teaching, the whole point, the big idea, is that everything that you and I have should be viewed as a resource to further God's kingdom because we are God's stewards. We are to use our master's resources to further our master's goals because we've been entrusted with material possessions. We've been entrusted with spiritual assets that are intended to be used not just to benefit ourselves, but to benefit others and to benefit them in an eternal way. It's really all about kingdom building. It's about investing in something that is more than just here and now, but something that's bigger than us. How many know that the truth is that if we can't steward worldly resources, how can we expect God to entrust heavenly resources to us? After all, Jesus said, if you are faithful, in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones. Now let's break this down because when it comes to the resources that we steward, there are so many things that God has entrusted to us that we are stewards over. But when it comes to the most important things that you and I have to steward, we commonly will summarize them into three categories. And these are them today, if you're taking notes, time, talent, and treasure. First, let's talk about time. And I just want to say from the get-go that time might be one of the most difficult things to steward because there are constantly so many different things that are fighting for our time, and yet we only have a finite amount of it. I know that for me, out of all three, time, talent, treasure, my biggest struggle is my time. But the way that you and I steward our time, it reveals what we value most. You see, most of our days are spent doing the things that we have to do, like work or school or preparing for things that are coming up and deadlines that we have to meet, keeping commitments that we made, showing up for meetings. Welcome to adulting, right? where we value productivity, efficiency, these ambition-driven goals that we have. But when it comes to the little bit of free time that we have to ourselves, how do we steward that? We all have hobbies, recreation, entertainment. How many know that there's nothing wrong with any of those things, right? 
They're all good. They're all part of resting and relaxing and enjoying. God wants us to rest and to relax and to enjoy. But here's a harder question that we need to ask ourselves today. How much of your time does God get? Does he only get an hour and a half from us every week when we come and sit in this room? Maybe for some of us it's even less because we're only here two Sundays a month. Does he hear from us daily? Or does he only hear from us weekly? Or does he only hear from us when we're in need of something? No, it's interesting when you think about it. God is the one who established time. God is the one who has given us life at a specific moment in time. And so therefore, every single day that we have is a gift from him. And yet how much of your time and my time is devoted back to him? You see, in the parable that Jesus told, it's all about stewarding wisely what we're given now in light of the future. So shouldn't our time now be used for the things that will matter in eternity. Let's take that a step further. If eternity, if heaven is going to be primarily centered around communing with our creator and bringing our worship to the feet of Jesus, being in his presence day and night, night and day, we should probably start practicing for that right here, right now. I mean, wouldn't it be good stewardship? to devote as much time as we possibly could to daily get into the presence of God. Why is that such a struggle for us? I don't know about you, and I'm just going to be honest and transparent today, but sometimes I'll quickly open up Facebook or Instagram, Instagram, and I don't know if you've ever done this before, but you fall into this black hole, and before you know, it's like the next day. You just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Sometimes we get sucked in to what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is saying. Sometimes I give too much of my time away to things that have no eternal value. And all of us are susceptible to this. We're more practiced in navigating Google than we are in navigating Scripture. And then when there's something that we need to know from the Word of God, we're clueless about it. Why? Because we haven't spent enough time in His Word. We'll listen to more TED Talks, but we don't have time to listen to sermons or better yet, listen to God speaking to us directly. We have the words memorized to our favorite songs by our favorite artists that we've listened to time after time after time, but we need words on a screen for worship in church. Why? Why? It's because of how we spend our time. It's all about stewardship. And some of us think that we need more time to get everything done. I'm guilty of saying that. I've said that before. I don't have enough hours in the day. But what we really need to do is to manage and utilize and steward the time that we have been given wisely. Because when we are good stewards of the time, that we've been given. And when we don't waste time doing things that don't possess an eternal value, we will be fruitful and effective for the kingdom of God. How many want to be fruitful and effective for the kingdom of God? Now let's talk about talent because this is another important one that we need to look at. Now when I say talent, I'm not talking about talent like a talent show. We're not looking for jugglers and flaming baton twirlers. That's not what Jesus means. I'm talking about what God has given you in the form of gifting and ability. You know, the Bible says that God has given each of us gifts. And we all have some innate ability that was put there because God intended for it to be a tool to build his kingdom. Some of these qualities, they might have a direct impact on the profession that you are working in right now because of the special ability or the gift that God wove into the fabric of your DNA. I can certainly see that in my life. I talk too much, and look what God is doing with me right now. 
I talk full time. Some of you are saying, I wish you would stop talking. My teachers thought it was a problem. Turns out it was my gift. Maybe it's your athletic ability that made you go pretty far in sports. Maybe you excel in math and you ended up in, in accounting or doing something with numbers. Maybe you love law, you love the legal system and you studied hard to become a lawyer. Maybe you love to cook or to bake and so that's what you do, that's your jam. You are hospitable, you cook and bake and invite all of your friends and all of your family over. And listen, if that's you, I will meet you right down here after church because I wanna be your friend. I love to eat. But your talents are the gifts and the abilities that God has given to you. But what does stewardship have to do with this? Is this like some kind of like if you don't use it, you'll lose it kind of thing? That's not where I'm going with this. When we're talking about stewarding your talent, we're talking about your gifts, talents, and abilities not being about you and not being for you. In order to steward a gift that God has given us, that means that we aren't using that gift to be seen or to draw attention to us. Instead, we use it in a way that will bring more attention to God. And more attention to God. More than just attention to God, we want to bring him honor. We want to bring him the glory. That's how we steward our talent. You know, it's also about serving others. Did you know that God made you good at things that other people aren't good at so that way you could serve them? Did you know that? It's like a divine setup. You're good at it because God intended for you to use it for others who would need it. I love what scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Listen to this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is what it's all about. It's not about you. It's not so we can clap for you. It's not so that you can clap for me. It's so that every eye would be on Jesus that he would get the glory and the honor and the praise. So when we're talking about joining a serve team, which by the way, today is the third and the final week of our expo, that you'll be able to meet with some of our team members in the lobby and get plugged in and connected on one of our serve teams. But the whole reason that we're asking everyone who calls CTI their home to get connected to a serve team is because everyone here has a different gift, a different talent, and a different ability. And let me tell you this, you can't do everything, but you can do something. And when it comes to stewardship, what you can do is meant to be used in service to others because we're all called to serve others. And when we use our gifts to serve others, the Bible says... We just read it, that we're being faithful stewards of God's grace over our lives. You know, there are so many gifted people in this world, so many, but they're using their gift in a way that is selfish. And I don't want to generalize, and I don't want to make a blanket statement because certainly this isn't true of everyone in this category that I'm going to reference. But I think that this is so true and so common of those in the entertainment industry. Some of the most gifted and talented people, but they've used their gift as a means to obtain and gain wealth and to make a name for themselves. And I don't know about you, but often I'll hear about different artists, musical artists that all had their start the beginning of their music journey was on a platform at their local church. But then somewhere along the way, 
it got distorted. And it wasn't laid on the altar to the Lord. Instead, it was a means to an end. Can you imagine if they would steward their gift differently and use their platform to build God's kingdom instead of their own? Do you know how many people would come to know the Lord with the platform that some of these famous people have? And I want to encourage you, church, this isn't even in my notes today, but would you start praying for those who have more influence than yourself that God would radically wreck their lives and that their influence, their platform, would be a means to bring souls into the kingdom instead of dollar bills into their accounts? God can do that. He can do that. That's what we've been called to. That's why we have to steward our talents, our gifts, to bless God and to bless others. Now let's get to this last one. And you might want to brace yourself because we're going to talk about our treasure. And when we talk about our treasure, we're really talking about money. And this is where almost everybody jumps ship off the stewardship. We could talk about time. We could talk about my talents here. I'll give them all to Jesus. But don't tell me what to do with my money, right? Well, it turns out that this book that I have, look at that. Wow, who put that there? This book talks a lot about money. And Jesus himself taught a lot about money. And it's probably because money is one of the most necessary things in life to live and survive. And at the same time, it is one of the most difficult things to steward. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One more time, all together. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And again, as it relates directly to the parable that Jesus told about the shrewd manager, the whole point is that God wants us to use what we have to make an eternal impact. When you think about an investment, it usually involves designating a certain amount of money now in order for it to grow into something more substantial when? Later. And if you're a good investor, you will end up with more later than you started with now. And if that's not the way that it's going, you're not an investor, you're a gambler. When it comes to investing in God's kingdom, the same principle is true. Except the maturity date of the kingdom investments, they're not always received on this side of heaven. Most of them will be where? In eternity. So this also means that we have to steward our finances in a way that demonstrates obedience to God. And this is where many people have an issue because I'm going to talk about tithing and generosity for a moment. Ushers, please lock the doors. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's talk about the tithe. What does the tithe mean? The tithe means tenth. It's 10% of our earnings that belong to God. In scripture, it was a tenth of their harvest or a tenth of their crops, a tenth of their grain. But it's not just the 10% that's the important part. It's the first 10% right off the top because how many know and agree that God is deserving of the best, not just whatever we have left over to scrape together and give to him? Great, five people in the room agree with that. And I just, I want to share with you my personal conviction, this is my personal conviction, is that tithing is not considered generosity. It's considered obedience. If it belongs to God, 
If it belongs to God, then when I give God my 10%, which I've been doing since I was 14 years old and had my first job, I'm not, I'm not telling you to do something that I don't walk in. But if it belongs to God, then I'm not being kind or generous to him. I'm just being obedient to him. And let me tell you, it takes faith to give the first. Because giving to God first means that you're putting yourself in a position that you have to trust him with everything else after that. And how many have a lot of bills that need to be paid? Yeah, in northern New Jersey we do, right? It takes faith to give the first. But I want you to see what this looks like today. And I've done this illustration before, and they're going to bring out these tables this morning. And we have two tables right up here, one to my right and one to my left. One represents everything that God has given us. The other represents what we give back to God first. So if I have 10 bags of apples, okay, that means that 10% of 10 bags is... If I have 10 bags of apples, 10% of 10 bags is one bag of apples. That comes to God because it comes right off the first. Now, what do we have next? We got oranges coming. And so if we have 10 bags of oranges that are coming over here to my table, then I'm going to make sure that I tithe one of those right over here to God's table. Now, the other nine, they just hang out right here and they stay there. Hey, can we hyperdrive that uh, that line because I'm ready for that next fruit. Next we have how many people love a good summer watermelon. So if I have 10 watermelon, then I'm going to make sure that I take the first of the 10 watermelon and that's going to come over here. I'm going to give that back to God in obedience first because God gave it all. I'm the steward of it, but the first one right off the top comes to God. Next we have kiwi. How many people struggle to eat kiwi? Right? I think that might be the most, the hardest piece of fruit to do. But we have, if we have 10 kiwi, then the first one is going to come right over here. It's going to be given back to God. The other nine, they get to hang out over here. And I got to figure out how to peel every single one of those kiwi if I'm going to enjoy it. What do we got next? Next we have lemons. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. But the first one of those 10 lemons are going to come over here. Here, I'm going to give it to God first. Now, the other nine are going to park it right over here, and I'm going to have more lemonade that I could ever drink in my life. What do we got coming next? We got pineapple. All right. How many like pina colata? Virgin pina colata. No alcohol in that pina colata. Okay. I got this pineapple, I got 10 of them coming over here. Nine are going over there, but this one comes to God's table because I'm gonna give him that first 10% right off the top. One out of 10 comes to him. Next, we have cantaloupe. How many people like cantaloupe? Cantaloupe is the thing that I leave behind in every fruit salad because I don't like cantaloupe. But if I got 10 cantaloupe, how many are coming over here? One, it's going back to God. I'm going to give it back to God. Next, what do we have? I think we got bunches of grapes. How many people are green grape fa fans? How many people prefer red grapes? All right, but if I got green grapes, I'm going to get 10 bags. One of them comes over here. The other nine, they park it right over there. Man, this is getting exhausting. I'm, I need like an inhaler up here or something. We have... What do we have? Is this the last one? Bananas. Come on. If I got 10 bunches of bananas, one's going to come right over here. The other nine are going to stay right there. Would you just take a moment and would you look at this side and would you look at that side? Here's the deal. We get to keep all of this. What does God ask us for? He asks us to be obedient in giving this to him. You know what you and I get? We get the overflow. We get the abundance. We get the blessing. This 90% right here, if you give God what belongs to him, this is going to go further than 100% because you were obedient and there is a blessing wherever there is obedience. 
And can I say one more thing? We would say, oh, okay, well, this is God's table and this is our, this is all his anyway. It's all his. This is not just his. This is his too, but he blessed you with it. Listen to what the Bible says about it. Don't just listen to me. Listen to what the Bible says about this. Proverbs chapter 3. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Malachi chapter 3. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And remember this, it's not about tithing, it's about stewardship. And I want to say one last thing. If you can't steward this, if you can't steward and care for and manage this 90%, that 10% is not going to help you. What better investment is there that will make an eternal impact than the kingdom of God? Now listen, listen. The critic this morning, and I'm sure they're here because they attend every Sunday morning. I know that for sure. <laughs> Critics are always here, and they love to give their feedback. What do they say in the South? Well, bless their little heart, right? But the critic would say, well, well, the two verses that you just used, they were from the Old Testament. We're in the new covenant. We're living in the age of grace. We're no longer under the law. I hear this all the time. This is the biggest argument of people that they will use to not tithe. But it's a ridiculous argument. First, let's just address the fact that if you are trying to argue and find reasons to not give to God, you have bigger problems to address than just money. You have a heart issue that needs to be addressed. Because it's not about the money. It's about this. But beyond that, the tithe did not even originate in the law. The tithe is in the law, but it did not originate in the law. As a matter of fact, the tithe predates and precedes the law because in Genesis chapter 14, before there even was a law, Abraham tithed before the law even existed. And you say, okay, well, that's still Old Testament. All right. Okay. Let's fast forward then to the New Testament. Because Jesus himself references tithing in the New Testament. But listen, I'm not here to debate with anyone. That's not what this message is about. It's about stewardship. And so the reality is that if God is the biggest priority in your life, he will be the biggest priority in your finances too. And if there's any argument to be made that 10% is no longer relevant because we're in the New Testament church. Guess what? In the New Testament, the percentage only went up anyway. Because in Luke chapter 3, Jesus said that if one of you has two tunics, you should give one away. You should keep one and give the other one away. I don't know. I'm no mathematician, but that sounds like 50% giving away right there. In Mark chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler. And what did he tell him to do? Did he say sell some of your possessions? Did he say sell half of your possessions? No, he said go and sell all of your possessions and give them all away to the poor. That's giving 100%. So if there's any argument about the New Testament age of grace that we are still living in, the percentages only get more radical. And some of us struggle with the 10%. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Catch this, church. Stay with me. Everything you have, everything, everything you have, your time, your talent, your treasure, it all comes down to how you steward it. When we give God prime time in our day, 
to be in his presence. That's good stewardship. When you use your talents, the gifts, and the abilities that God has given you, and when you get on a serve team, and when you use what God has given you to bless other people here at CTI and to build his kingdom, that, that is good stewardship. When you financially support the church, when we give to kingdom builders, when we generously meet the needs of others in the name of Jesus, like a group will be going out in a couple of moments to give hot meals to people on the streets of Patterson. When we invest in those kind of things, that is good stewardship. But we have to remember that it's all his anyway. You know, this message that I shared with you this morning is what I call a Nike message. You know what a Nike message is? Just do it. You know, we don't have to pray about it. We don't have to get three dreams, a vision, and a prophetic utterance to see if we should tithe or if we should sign up to be on a serve team or if we should spend time every day with Jesus. That's just what we should do. And so that's our response today. I'm going to invite the ushers to come all the way up front along the balcony as well. And I'm going to ask everybody to stand together with me today because we're going to prepare our hearts to do two things. One, we're going to bring the tithe into the storehouse of the Lord. And can I remind you that what we just read from Scripture a moment ago, God gave us permission to test him in this one area. Let me tell you, there are not many areas that you want to test God in. But God gave us permission to test him in this and see if he will not open up the floodgates of heaven. I know that this is difficult for some of us, but it's obedience. The first thing we're going to do is give. The second thing we're going to do is if you are not using the gift that God has deposited in you. If you are not involved in service, listen, this is not an organization trying to build teams. That's not what this is. This is the people of God trying to build the kingdom of God. Because at the end of the day, when the trumpet sounds and when the Lord returns, this building is not going to matter anymore. Our Sunday morning schedule is not going to matter anymore. Our YouTube channel, our Instagram page, none of those things will matter anymore. But you know what will matter? Souls that made it into the kingdom of God because there were people who said, you know what? I can serve the Lord. I can serve in the church. I can serve my brothers and sisters. And so I'm going to pray. And the worship team, hey, can you guys do like the biggest kicking song that we did like in the beginning of the message, the service today? Okay, yeah, yeah, praises, that'll be good. But as they kick it off, you're free to come forward and give or to go to the serve team. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you've blessed us so much. God, we sit back and we look and we say, we don't even deserve all of the good things that you've given us. But God, we know that every good and perfect thing has come from you. And so, Father, I pray that with your help, that we would be the wise stewards that you're calling us to be, that we would be about building your kingdom, that we would see the lost found, that we would see the broken healed, that we would see change and transformation in our neighborhood, in our nation, and in all of the nations. Father, thank you that you invite us to be a part of what you are doing. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you and have an incredible...